half of the central angle has already been marked and it's 22.5. So now you're going to have to find the apothem. So if I have an angle measurement and I have the opposite side, I need to find the apothem, which is what side compared to my angle? Adjacent. The adjacent. And when I'm doing opposite over adjacent, what does that mean I need to use? Tangent. So I know in that situation um, for number six, I'm going to have to have the tangent of my angle measure is equal to opposite over adjacent and solve to find the apothem. Same thing for number seven. The central angle has already been split in two for you. 20 degrees is that half of the central angle. So again, you can see now though, you're trying to find the apothem, but instead of the opposite side, which you could find the opposite if you wanted to divide 4.7 by two, or you could use, um, you can see the radius is seven, and you know that would be um, the hypotenuse. So now you've got hypotenuse and you need adjacent. So adjacent over hypotenuse is going to be what? What's that little number right there in the um, apostle? What the number? What number? Right there. On number seven, there's an A for apothem. Okay, so A stands for apothem. Okay, so the A's have been marked. That's what you need to find. So on number seven, you have a radius of seven, which we just said was the hypotenuse, okay? It also is, the apothem also is the adjacent side as well. So that kind of also helps you can say, hey, I'm trying to find the adjacent side. So on this, I have a hypotenuse and I have the adjacent. So if I have a hypotenuse and adjacent, what can I use? Cosine, C-A-H, okay? So I have an angle measure. I'm doing adjacent over hypotenuse. Number eight, trying to find the apothem again. What is my radius? Six, I need to find the apothem. So again, my radius is six, that's my hypotenuse. I need to find the adjacent. Number nine, what is my radius? Five, I need to find my um, adjacent, okay? What is my opposite side measure gonna be? Two and a half, good. So I can see my whole side is five, so my opposite side would be two and a half. So in that situation, if I have five and I have two and a half, really with all of these, if you wanna use, you could even use Pythagorean theorem to find your third side. All right, number 10 though, you do not have um, a central angle mark on nine and 10. You don't have central angles, so you're gonna calculate those on your own. Find your central angle first take half of the central angle, then that is going to be your degree measure. Then you're going to have to decide, am I using opposite over adjacent? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, opposite over adjacent. If I'm, am I doing opposite over hypotenuse, opposite um, or adjacent over hypotenuse? What am I doing to find my sides that I need? Hmm? So you just have two central angles, and that's your number of degrees? You could calculate your central angle and then divide that by two, and that gives you your degree measure that you're using. Okay, and then that's your degree measure that you're using with either sine, cosine, or tangent. Okay, and determining sine, cosine, or tangent depends on what sides you have present and what you're trying to solve for. Okay. Now let's look at 11, 12, 13, and 14. Find the indicated measure, round answers to the nearest tenth. So I'm trying to find the length of AB. 12, I'm trying to find the circumference of circle L. 13, I'm finding the radius of circle R. And 14, I'm finding the length of arc XY. So on these, what is my formula that I'm gonna be using? Wait. Numbers 11 through 14, what formula am I going to be using? It's going to be about 11 4, right? Mm -hmm. Look over on page 683. Arc length, four length, arc length. Where arc we length have our arc length over 2 pi over r. r is equal to the measure of my arc over 360. Plug in what you know, solve for what you don't know, okay? That's all going to be for 11 through 14.
let's turn over. You can see that 15 and 16 are marked out. If you would like to attempt those for bonus points, have at it, but you don't have to. Okay. Let's look at 17 through 20. The area of circle D is 113.1 square meters. The area of sector ADB is 34.6 square meters. Find the indicated measure. So here I'm finding radius, circumference, the measure of arc AB, and the length of arc ACB. So go ahead and turn, since we're talking about area of our figures, go ahead and turn to page 692. Sorry, you got a lot of it. 692, we have our area of a sector. Notice our formula here is area mm -hmm. over pi r squared is equal to the measure of AB over 360. Okay. So we're combining page 683 formulas and page 692 formulas. You're going to need to use both of these formulas in numbers 17 through 20. Okay, 17 through 20, you'll use your formula on 683 and the formula on 692. Isn't the, isn't the area of sector, isn't that an area over an area? Yes, area over area. So basically that's like one. Okay, but we're, but we're um, since it's area over area, we're talking about the area of, um, so in the first one, we're talking about the area of the sector over my total area. So notice, we have two areas in this problem. We have the area of my whole circle, and then I have the area of my sector. So one will go in the numerator, one will go in the denominator. Okay, so you have to look at your examples, figure out which one is going in the numerator, which one's going in the denominator of that formula on page 692. 21 and 22, find the area of the shaded region, round answers to the nearest tenth if necessary. So look at number 21. I've got kind of like a bullseye figure. Okay, so what is my total radius in number 21? Three, Three feet. Okay, what is the, what is my segment? Um, so, so you can see where they've broken it into from my center. I can see that it's going to be one to the first center. So, so my little bitty small center, my shaded one, the radius is what? One. What is the radius of my white circle? Two. What is the radius of my big circle? Three. Okay, so I've got to find my area of each of them and figure out what am I having to subtract and what am I having to leave over? 22. So on 21, 22, how would you, because all you know is the radius, so how would you solve that? Well, how do you find the area of a circle? What's the formula for the area of a circle? Pi r squared. All I need is my radius. Okay. You can use 3.14. I'll do all of our answers using just 3.14. So, um, can you also type in pi r? Yes. If you want to type in pi in your calculator, that'll be fine. I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make sure that all of my answers are accommodated. I'm not going to be nitpicky as far as what's after the decimal point. Okay. What I'll be focusing more is like what's, um, your whole numbers are, um, but it says round to the nearest tenth. So anyway, 22, we can see I've got a rectangle in my box. It looks like a square to me, but they have told me that my side measures are different. I can see that the bottom and top are 20. My sides are 21. Okay. So I'm going to need to find the area of my square. I've got to find the area of my circle. Okay. Subtract the square from the or rectangle from the circle number now but real quick what do i need to find to have my area of a circle i've got to have a radius notice they've given me a diameter but do i know the measure no so what am i going to have to do with my rectangle in the middle i've got to use pythagorean theorem and treat it as a triangle and i can see that the bottom is 20 a side is 21 so to calculate that um the hypotenuse or to calculate what is my diameter? I'm going to have to use Pythagorean theorem and then whatever that is, divide by two for my radius to find the area of that circle. Okay, so multiple steps in these. 23, what is the area of a regular 15 gone that has a radius of 10 feet? So think about the area of a regular 15 gone. Okay, that has a radius of 10 feet. I know my radius. 
what can I do to find, um, so for area, area equals one half AP. So I'm treating this like a, I've got to break it into like triangles. So I think about, I've got to find my central angle. Okay, find my central angle, divide by two. I've got to think about my radius is 10 feet. So I'm going to be, that's going to be my hypotenuse. So I'm going to have to find my missing sides to be able to find my perimeter and all that good stuff. Same thing with number 24. What is the area of a regular 20 gone with a side length of 12 centimeters? So they've told me a side length. I can find my perimeter using that. I know that when I divide that by two, I know each half of a side is six. So when I use my little triangles, kind of how we're broken into. So basically 23 and 24, you're gonna visualize as like these pictures here in numbers seven and eight, but know that they're bigger figures, okay? So you've got bigger figures, so you're gonna to have to calculate the central angles first, divide by two, use the measures that you know to find what you don't know, to find the apothem and the perimeter, and that's how you find the area, okay? These are due next Thursday, the last day of class. Okay, these are due the last day of class. Um, so all of chapter 11 work, all of chapter 11 work, chapter 11 notes, chapter 11 tests due the last day. And okay, what pardon? And what you handed us. Yes, and whatever your note card is, because the kind of thing is that if you owe me test corrections, I have how many you missed on the original. So if you don't turn in test corrections, I'll just put in your original grade, okay? So if you want to earn back points, and then what I'll also do is um, I will send you test corrections for chapter 11. You'll have the option to do those. I'll just need them in. I'll grade them as quickly as I can and get them to you probably. I'll, I'll try to get them back to you um, by Friday of next week. And then that way you can give me corrections within a week and then I'll be finalizing grades, okay? So if you wanna do test corrections on 11, you'll have the opportunity to do that. <clears throat> All right, so everybody's good with chapter 11 test. Everybody feels like they've looked at it. Any questions on anything you can't read on it? I know that the shading and the <clears throat> things um, that are written in. So just look at number, um, real quick, number one, you can see that the 32 is written in for the hypotenuse of that triangle. Number two, a 42 has been written in at the top. 35 has written, been written in on my side measure. And then that number that's in the shading is 37. So make sure you can read that clearly. Number three, my diagonals. Um, you can see I have two diagonals that each measure nine and two diagonals that each measure 12. Number four, my diagonals that go top to bottom, you can see that those are each 10. See that the number 36 is pointing to the arrow of the diagonal on the left-hand side. The 24 on the right-hand side is pointing to that diagonal. So I have a diagonal of 36, a diagonal of 24, and that other 26 is the side measure. Number five, a 25 has been written on the right-hand side and a 50 at the bottom. Number six, the A is marked for the apothem. Six is written for half of the side length of, a, of my side. And then that angle measure is 22.5, 22.5. Number seven, the A is written for the apothem. The radius is seven and our angle measure is 20 degrees. And that side measure is 4.7. 28, my radius is six. The A is marked for the apothem. The, the um, half of the central angle is 25.7. That is not 257, it is 25.7. So if you need to make that a little more clear, 25.7. And then the side measure of 5.2. Number nine, five is my radius. A is marked for the apothem and five is my side measure. And I think that's all that's really been marked that you might not be clear. All right. What, wait, what's the big five? I'm sorry. What's the big five on number nine? The side measure oh, of each, yeah, each side. So basically, so each half side is two and a half. Okay. All right. So if you have any questions, be sure to let me know. These are due next Thursday. All righty. So.
Next, we're going to go ahead and start on chapter 12. So in your book, go ahead and open up to page. Seven hundred and nineteen. This chapter is dealing with surface area and volume. So like when we talk about the surface area of a figure, like if I'm talking about our Clorox wipes, okay, this is a solid and I can see I have two bases and what are my bases made up of? Plastic. Circles. Uh, plastic. <laughs> not wrong. Yes, you are right. It is plastic. They are plastic circles. Okay, so when I talk about the area of a figure, I look to see how many bases does my figure have. In this one, it has two, but then I can see that it has round sides. So we're going to be talking about things. Um, we're going to be talking about our bases and how to find the area of a base. But then we're going to talk about surface area, lateral area, things like that, that accommodates the deal with our sides. Okay. So um, 12.1, exploring solids. So it says a polyhedron is a solid that is bounded by polygons called faces that enclose a single region of space. An edge of a polyhedron is a line segment formed by the intersection of two faces. A vertex of a polyhedron is a point where two or more edges meet. The plural of polyhedron is polyhedra or polyhedrons. So you can either tack an S on it. Um, the main thing to know is that a vertex, the plural of that is vertices. You don't call them vertexes, okay? So let's look at number one, example one. Decide whether the solid is a polyhedron. If so, count the number of faces, vertices, and edges on the polyhedron. So real quick, let's, talk, let's go back where we talked about faces. Our faces are made up of polygons. Okay, and remember, what is our definition of a polygon? A polygon is a closed figure made up of what? Way back, I don't even know, chapter four or so, I don't even know, four or six, something like that. Polygon, remember, is it's made up of sides, right? So is this considered a polygon? Why? This isn't made up of sides, okay? This is a rounded surface. Okay, so this is not, so anything that is rounded is not going to be considered a polyhedron because it is not made up of sides. So look at letter A. Is this a figure made up of sides and faces? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so how many faces do I have? Five. Five, because I have my three triangular sides and my two bases. Okay, so how many vertices do I have? Six. Triangle on the right. Mm -hmm. Good. So I have six vertices, and I can see where my vertex is going to be where face meets face meets face. So I've got three things meeting at one point. Okay. And then how many edges do I have in letter A? Nine. Nine. Five faces, six vertices, nine edges. Letter B, this is not a polyhedron. Why? What's it's the one faces, thing? They're not, they're not all Why? What? What? It, what it, part it, is not a polygon? Like the floor, the side is. Okay, so I've got two triangular sides, two triangular faces, but notice I've got one curved side, so it throws it out. Letter C. Yes. Why? What is its base? How many sides uh, does the base have? One. No. Six. Six. So it's a hexagon. So I have a hexagonal base. My base is a hexagon and each side is made up of what? Triangle. Triangles. Okay. So I have a hexagon base. I have triangular sides and they all meet at one vertex at the top. Okay. So we're going to learn that this is actually called a pyramid. This is a, hexa a hexagonal pyramid. Okay. So if we look at the types of solids at the bottom of the five solids below, the prism and pyramid are polyhedra. The cone, cylinder, and sphere are not polyhedra. So we can see that we do have solid figures at the bottom, but only the prism and pyramid are going to be polyhedra because they are made up of sides that are faces. Okay. 
okay, on letter C. Mm -hmm. Okay, so think about um, how many, so if I have six sides of my base, right? Okay, so I have six sides, so that means I have six triangles and one base, so that means I have seven faces. I have seven vertices, I have seven places where I have points and then 12 edges because I have six edges along the bottom and then I have six edges on the sides. Okay, so I have edges around the bottom and then I have also have edges going up the sides. Okay. Go ahead and turn over to page 720. A polyhedron is regular if all of its faces are congruent regular polygons. So just like we've talked about regular, if, it's, if my faces are all regular polygons, then it is a regular polyhedron. A polyhedron is convex if any two points on its surface can be connected by a segment that lies entirely inside or on the polyhedron. If this segment goes outside the polyhedron, then it is non-convex or concave. So remember how we talked about convex and concave when we were talking about polygons? Same thing with a polyhedron, okay? So let's look at example two, classifying polyhedra. Is the octahedron convex? Is it regular? So look at letter A. Look at letter A. Is this a regular polyhedra? Yeah. Yes, because we can see where they've made marks of congruence. They've shown me that all of my sides are congruent. So they are, it's made up of regular um, triangles. We know it's a regular, it's equilateral triangles. And then convex or concave? Convex. Convex, because no lines would be going through it. Letter B. Letter B. Non-convex. So we. And non-regular. Okay, so it is convex, nothing would connect through the middle, but it is non-regular because only my bases are congruent. My faces, the length of my faces are not the same measures. So only my bases are congruent, but my side faces are not, my lateral sides are not. And then we can see that C is non-convex and non-regular, okay, because I can see where the figure goes into itself and then also they are not all equal measures. All right, the next thing underneath that says, imagine a plane slicing through a solid. The intersection of the plane and the solid is called a cross section. So basically, if you think about like cutting it in half, so we can see where they have this sphere. And if we put a plane that cuts straight through it, that's what we're calling a cross section, as would be that part that goes through the middle. For instance, the diagram shows that the intersection of a plane and a sphere is a circle. So I can think about that. I can imagine that sphere being cut by a plane and I can see that that cross section is a circle. Is everybody good with that? So in example three, we're describing the cross section. So look at letter A. If I have a cross section of my cube, what is the, the shape that's formed at the cross section? A square. a square. Look at letter B. My cross section is diagonal. So if it's going through diagonally, what kind of shape is it making? A pentagon. And letter C, we can see where my cross section is coming through, but it's only cutting off a corner. So what kind of shape is it making? Triangle. A triangle. So based on where the cross section cuts through a shape, we've seen that it's crossing through a cube on all of these, but when it crosses through straight through the middle, it's a square, diagonally makes a pentagon, but on the corner just makes a triangle, okay? And it says um, at the bottom of that, it says some other cross sections are the rectangle, trapezoid, and hexagon. So they, all those shapes can be made. We got about three more minutes and then we'll break. Goal two on page 721, Euler's theorem. There are five regular polyhedra called platonic solids after the Greek mathematician and philosopher Plato. The platonic solids are a regular tetrahedron that has four sides, a cube that has six faces. Um, sorry, a tetrahedron has four faces, a cube has six faces, a regular octahedron has eight faces, a regular dodecahedron has 12 faces, and a regular icosahedron. Thank you, icosahedron. Right. Yeah. Has 20 faces. So let's think about this for a minute. 
tetrahedron has four faces. Okay, so look at these pictures. Look at the pictures below. Notice what does a regular tetrahedron look like? It has four faces, but what shape are each of my faces? Triangles. Triangles, because remember, I've got those three side faces and a base, so it's got four faces. My cube has six faces because I've got my four around the sides and then my two bases. Look at the octahedron. Notice it looks like two pyramids stuck in the end, okay? And then a, re a regular dodecahedron. I don't know enough about soccer, so Lucas, you'd be my question on this. How many faces does a soccer ball have? Do you have any clue? Uh, no? Well, All right, that's your challenge. All right. Um, I don't know. So I'm sure, do you have a soccer ball like in your car? Like? No. You're not prepared so. if a soccer game breaks out somewhere? No, I don't have it. Okay. okay. We're going to give you that challenge to check your soccer ball and see how many faces it has and see what kind of. Um, and, and next time you go to a game, you can go, uh, do you realize that we are playing with a geometric polyhedron? And everybody's going to like go, oh my gosh, Lucas is a genius. And so you're going to be like sports and math go together. Okay. And then um, the regular icosahedron has 20 faces, 12 vertices, 30 edges. Notice that the sum of the number of faces and its vertices. Okay. So listen to this. Notice that the sum of the number of faces and vertices is two more than the number of edges. And that's where we'll come back. I'm going to um, copy our notes real quick. I like come back in there. I don't want to. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right. No, I don't care. Oh, we got notes. Yeah. Oh my. Oh. 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 Alrighty. Oh. oh you didn't get any homework. Yeah. I that's not true. I mean, I didn't give you homework. There's no homework numbers on the notes. Well, that must be an ex uh, 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 an accident. No, let's go. <clears throat> That must be an accident. Wait, are you, are you serious or that it doesn't? I don't know yet. <laughs> the accent turns into. What? <laughs> I'm probably hitting his. Um... I'm probably hitting his room. I'm probably hitting his room. There's this guy in our class. Oh, no. Cruise? No, Cruise. No, no, no. He wrote a, he, wrote, he had to write six pages or more. He wrote four pages. <laughs> and if he gets a A or more on that paper, I'm saying he's going to live the rest of life. I wrote, I wrote six pages. No. He said, you got to do, you got to do better work on me. Hey, Cruise, he didn't write one. He said he has like a 98 on that. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Oh, wait. So, let's, real quick, you've got your notes, so let's go back and fill in what we have covered so far. All right. So, notice. Um, you will be filling in your notes for 12-1. We've already talked about them, so your homework assignment will be to fill in your notes. Yes! <laughs> well, you've got a test. No, I'm just saying for right now, you've got to fill in 12-1. We've already talked about those, okay? So as of now, we're getting ready to get to Euler's theorem, which is going to be our last point on here. So we're getting ready to cover the last point on here. So you'll need to go back and fill in 12-1 notes. All right, Euler's theorem says that the number of faces, F, vertices, V, and edges, E, of a polyhedron are related by the formula F plus V equals E plus 2. So faces plus vertices equals edges plus 2. Okay? Faces plus vertices, so this is the last bullet point on 12-1, underneath the box that says theorem 12-1, Euler's theorem. F plus V equals E plus two on page 721. What's the first couple notes? What did I just say? Go back, but I, aren't they in the book, right? Yes, we just went word yes. through word through them, so you'll go back in homework and fill them in. Okay, all right, but not right now. Not right now. <laughs> all right, turn over to page 723. All right, so look at number six. No, let's look at number three. Number three on 723. Polyhedron or not? Yes. Why? there are what do all my sides have to be eight vertices well i'm not looking for numbers i'm just saying what do all my no. sides have to be they all have to be polygons right yeah. so i can see i've got triangles and rectangles maybe a square at the bottom i'm not real sure because well no i guess it couldn't be because the the side lengths Anyway, so I, I've got different shapes, but I can see that they're all polygons. They all have flat faces. Number four, polyhedron or not? Yes. Yes, what about five? No. No. All right, six, seven, eight, and nine. I'm using Euler's theorem. So look at your Euler's theorem that we just looked at. 
I need to find the number of faces if my vertices are six and my edges are 12. So let's think about this for a minute. We just said that Euler's theorem says F plus V equals E plus two. So if we look at it, we're trying, we have oh, F, F, V, E. They've told me that E is 12, V is six, and I need to find faces. So all I've got to do is plug in F plus six equals 12 plus two. So F plus six equals 14. Subtract six, subtract six. How many faces do I have? Eight. Eight. Good, so all I'm doing is plugging in what I know, solving for what I don't know. Yes. And also, could you, couldn't you just not do that and just um, what do you call, add two to the edges? There's always two more. The faces and the verses are always two more. Okay, so, so let's look at number seven. If you add two more to the edges, what do you have? 11. 11, so how can I find my number of vertices? 11 minus five. Very good, is? Six. Good. Number eight. How many edges do I have? 15. Plus two. 17. Minus 10. Seven. So I have seven faces. Nine. This one, I've got to find my edges. Nine. So how many faces do I have? One. Vertices? Four. Okay. So now I've got 12 is equal to what plus two? E. Uh. So I have 20 plus 12 is oh, equal 30. to E plus two. Good, 30. so 32 is equal to E plus two. So E is 30. Okay, so I just plug in. All right, um, 10, polyhedron or not? No. Nope, I have a curved top. 11? Yes. 12? No. 12? Yes, because I have a lot of those. Okay, even though I've got a funky little corner there, but it's still a triangle, so I still have flat faces. So they're all polygons. All right. Um, look at number 16. 16 through 18, decide whether the polyhedron is regular and or convex. Number 16. E, convex and regular. Okay, so we've got... Um, <laughs> Convex and regular. What about 17? Uh, convex, that's it. It's not regular. Convex, not regular. What about 18? Not regular. Not regular. Convex. Not convex. Notice my sides are slanted, and so I would it's going to be concave. All right. Let's look at numbers 25 through 28. Look at my cross sections in 25. <laughs> My cross section of my sphere ends up making what? Circle. What about 26? My cross section Circle. of a cone. Circle. What about 27? My cross section of my pyramid. Pentagon. Pentagon. What about the cross section of my um, cylinder? Rectangle. Rectangle. Good. Good, okay, good. All right. So this is basically just an introduction for polyhedrons, mm -hmm. understanding that they're made up of faces, um, vertices edges. Let's go ahead and turn to 12.2, surface area of prisms and cylinders. Surface area of prisms and cylinders. And so finding the surface area of a prism. A prism is a polyhedron with two congruent faces called faces. Okay. So when I talk about a prism, I'm going to have two bases, top and bottom. Remember a minute ago when we looked at our pyramid? Our pyramid has a point, okay? So a pyramid is gonna have one base and a point, whereas a prism will have two bases. That's the main difference between a prism and a pyramid. So I have two bases. The other faces of my um, prism are called lateral faces, okay? Basically lateral, we've talked about means sides. So my lateral faces, so I have a bases and lateral faces. Okay, and the lateral faces are parallelograms formed by connecting the corresponding vertices of the bases. The segments connecting these vertices are called lateral edges. So now we have lateral edges, which are gonna be the sides where my, my sides connect. It makes a line, which will be an edge. The altitude or height of a prism is the perpendicular distance between its bases. 
and a right prism, each lateral edge is perpendicular to both bases. What does perpendicular mean? Okay, so when I say perpendicular, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about they, it comes straight down, straight across, 90 degree angle, okay? Um, in a right prism, each lateral edge is perpendicular to both bases. Prisms that have lateral edges that are not perpendicular to the bases are called oblique prisms. The length of the oblique lateral edges is the slant height of the prism. So look at our pictures from under goal one on page 728. I can see my right rectangular prism because it's stacked straight top to bottom. I can see that it's making a 90 degree angle. My height comes down to the base and makes a 90 degree angle. So that is called a right rectangular prism. If we look at the figure to the right, I can see that it's tilted or slanted. I still have two bases, but my, my bases are not parallel to each other, okay? So my slant height is gonna be the sloped height, whereas my actual height shows from it's my highest point to my lowest point, okay? But in these, we have to have what's called slant height. So kind of in a, a right triangle, we have slant height is, would be like our hypotenuse. Prisms are classified by the shapes of their bases. For example, the figures above show one rectangular prism and one triangular prism. So look at the first one, our right rectangular prism. My bases are rectangles. My oblique triangular prism are triangular bases, okay? The surface area of a polyhedron is the sum of the areas of its faces. The surface area is the sum of the area of its faces. The lateral area of a polyhedron is the sum of the areas of its lateral faces, okay? So surface area includes all of it, okay? If I was talking about, I'll use this clipboard, it's not a real good example because it's not very thick. Actually, I'll use my book, that'd be better. So if I said this is um, a rectangular prism, okay, notice that my bases would actually be my top of my book and my, my bottom of my book because these are the two rectangular pieces and then these are my lateral sides. So if I was doing surface area, I'm including the top of my book, the bottom of my book and all of my sides. But if I'm only talking lateral area, I'm only talking about the area of the sides. It does not include the bases. So example one, finding the surface area of a prism. Find the surface area of a right rectangular prism with a height of eight inches, a length of three inches, and a width of five inches. So we can see where they have a sketch. We can see we have um, a height of eight, a length of three, a width of five. So what I've got to do, I've got faces left and right. My dimensions there are eight by five and eight times five is 40. Front and back are eight and three. Eight times three is 24. And then top and bottom are three by five. Three by five is 15. But notice I have two, because I've got left and right. So I have 40 and 40. So I'm multiplying two times 40, which is 80. Then my front and back, front is 24, back is 24, so two times 24 is 48. And then my top and bottom, top is 15, bottom is 15, so two times 15 is 30. Add them up and you get the surface area is 158 inches squared. So I had to find the area of each different surface, then add them together, okay? I had to find the area of each surface, then add them together. So in 729, it says, imagine that you cut some edges of a right hexagonal prism and unfolded it. The two-dimensional representation of all the faces is called a net. So a net figure is like we took our three-dimensional figure and cut it apart and laid it out flat. Okay, so we can see where they've taken this figure, they cut it into pieces and they lay it out flat. So now I can see all my lateral sides that are all rectangles and I can see my bases that is a hexagon. I have two hexagonal bases in my lateral sides and I can see my height. So theorem 12.2 says the surface area of a right prism. The surface area S of a right prism can be found by using the formula S 
equals two times B plus P times H, where B is the area of the base. So I have to calculate the area of the base and multiply that by two because I have two bases. P is the perimeter of the base and H is the height. So I have to find the area of my base, the perimeter of the base and have the height to be able to calculate the surface area of a right prism. All right, so let's look at letter A on example two, page 729. What are my two bases? What shapes are my two bases? Rectangles. Rectangles, and what are their measures? 10. Nope. 15. Nope. 50, I'm sorry. Nope. What? <laughs> it's just like 30. this one. I know, but look at my figure, okay? Look at, um, let's see if I can draw this. Looking at letter A. It says each base measures five by 10. Uh-huh. No, that, those are not my bases though. Okay, so. Ah, how about that? All right. Wow. So they said this is 10, this is six, and this is five, right? Okay. So what do I know that this whole side is going to be? Or did I mark those wrong? I think I've got my five and six mixed up. No? Six is five. Just five needs to be right five. where the yeah. 10 is. So what is what is the measure of this bottom here? Right. Uh, 10 yeah, by yeah, five. that's right. Uh-huh. And so notice these are my bases here because I've got because my two bases, remember I only have two bases. And so um, each of my rectangles, Wait, aren't the bases the top and the bottom? it doesn't necessarily have to be the top and the bottom because I mean, like if it would stand up, could I stand my book up like this or I could lay it down mm -hmm. or I could lay it like this. It's not always gonna be the top and bottom. Okay. okay? So remember I have two polygon bases. So notice, these two are my bases, whereas all of these sides, I would have four sides that are the same. So that's what you've got to look at. What are my two sides that are different from the lateral faces? So just like my textbook here, okay, notice that this, this, and this, these are my lateral sides. This and this is my base, whether it's turned like this, turned like this, or like this. It doesn't matter what's top and bottom, okay? So when you're looking at bases, you're looking at what are the two that are exactly alike as far as, you know, and it just depends. It could really kind of change around depending on orientation, but in this situation, um, well, and I guess in this situation, because they are all different measures, it just depends on what way you're looking at it. Surface area is always gonna be the same though, because you're gonna multiply all the numbers. Okay, and that's the whole thing about, remember, multiplication is what? What's the word that I use that it tells me it does not matter what order I multiply in? No. So think about something probably that you would have learned in elementary math about our properties, like associative property and commutative property oh, yeah. and things like that. Remember, multiplication is commutative. So realistically, addition and multiplication are both commutative. So even if you mess up and pick the wrong thing for bases, you're still gonna get your surface area right because addition and multiplication are commutative. And by the time I multiply and add everything together, I'm gonna get the same thing anyway, okay? All right, so letter A, we can see we have bases and we've got our surface area is gonna be 280 inches squared. Look at letter B, we've got a triangle. Now, what kind of triangle is it? What is our base in letter B? Notice we have regular triangles here. So I can see I have seven, seven, and seven. Do you remember our formula for an equilateral triangle? 
1 fourth times the square root of 3 times side squared. Okay, so these formulas that we've dealt with before, we're coming back to see them. So on that one, when I find the area of my base, that's how I calculate the area of my base. So I've had to put in that formula. So I have two times 49 over four times the square root of three plus two times, I mean 21 times five, and I add them together, okay? Turn over to 7.30. It is warm in here, I'm about to die. Mine is sweatshirt. My eyes are red. All right, <laughs> goal two, finding the surface area of a cylinder. So again, like our Clorox wipes, we have two bases. So it says a cylinder is a solid with congruent circular bases that lie in parallel planes. The altitude or height of a cylinder is the perpendicular distance between its bases. The radius of the base is also called the radius of the cylinder. A cylinder is called a right cylinder, excuse me, if the segment joins the center, joining the centers of the bases is perpendicular to the bases. So because I have two circular bases, when I find the area of those, what is my area of a circle formula? Area equals pi r squared. So I've got two of those. So I find the area of my two bases, pi r squared. Then to find my lateral area, I have two times pi times the radius times the height. Okay, so that's what we found in theorem 1213. My, um, to find the lateral area is two times pi times r times h. So now I have to have two times my basis plus my lateral area. The lateral area of a cylinder is the area of its curved surface. So like we said, our Clorox wipes the rounded part. Okay, that's our lateral area. These are our bases. So I have to find the bases first, the lateral area, add them together, and that's my entire surface area. So is lateral area or surface area of a figure going to be larger? What is the larger areas of the two? Lateral area or surface area? Surface area. Why? No, lateral <laughs> area because surface area, surface area is equal to sum of lateral area. So if the surface area includes the lateral area plus something, which one's larger? Yeah, so think. I want y'all to think about this for a minute. Lateral area is just my sides. Surface area is sides plus bases. Okay, so surface area includes the entire figure. Lateral area does not include the bases. That's what I want you to remember about keeping these areas separate. Lateral area is only area of sides, whereas surface area is sides plus bases. Okay, so we found in theorem 12.3, surface area of a right cylinder, the surface area S of a right cylinder is S is equal to 2 times B plus CH, which equals 2 pi R plus 2 pi RH. So B is the area of the base, C is the circumference of the base, R is the radius of the base, and H is the height of the base. All right, so let's look at the example they gave us in example three. What is my radius of my base in example three? What does R equal? Page 730, example three. What is my radius? Three. I can see at the bottom, that's the radius of my circle. So if I'm finding the area of my two bases, I'm gonna have two times pi times three squared. What is three squared? Nine. nine, what is nine times two? 18. 18, so each base will be, I mean my two bases will be 18 times pi. 18. Okay, so 18 times pi is gonna be the area of my bases. Now let's look at what is my height of my cylinder? Four. Four, so remember in my, this formula, I'm using two times pi. Now to find the lateral area, I'm having to do two times pi times the radius times the height. So we've already said our radius is three, our height is four, what's three times four? 24, no, sorry, um, 12. 12 times two is 24. 
So we now we see we have 24 pi is going to be our surface in our lateral area. So base area is 18 pi, lateral area is 24 pi, add them together, and it's 42 pi. If I calculated that as a decimal, it would be approximately 131.95. Therefore, you could round to 132 square feet. Okay. Now, remember using that formula, as with any formula, and I'm trying to solve for something other than surface area, if I need to solve for a radius, I could. I plug in what I know, solve for my radius. If I'm trying to find a height, I plug in what I know, solve for my height. That's what they're doing in example four is solving for the height. So you start with your original formula, S equals two pi r squared plus two pi r h. Plug in the information that you know. We know that the surface area is 592.19. We know that the radius is 6.5. So I plug all of those things into my equation. I solve and then I'm able to find um, that eight is my height, approximately eight, okay? So one of the things we will be doing next week is I will have a worksheet with some practice examples that you'll be using these calculations in, okay? Um, Twelve three on page 735, surface area of pyramids and cones. So remember we talked about how pyramids are prisms. Pyramids and prisms are different because of what? What does a prism have that a pyramid does not have? A what? square base, a common vertex. What does a prism, I mean, a, a prism have that a pyramid does not have? How many bases does a prism have? Two. How many bases does a pyramid have? One, good. So prism has two bases, pyramid only has one, so it has a base and a vertex, okay, or that big top point, okay? So a pyramid is a polyhedron in which the base is a polygon and the lateral faces are triangles with a common vertex. The intersection of two lateral faces is a lateral edge. The intersection of the base and the lateral face is a base edge. The altitude or height of the pyramid is the perpendicular distance between the base and the vertex. Why are all of my sides of a pyramid a triangle? Why are they always, always a triangle? Exactly, if it was a different figure, it would have to have two bases and it would be a prism. But a pyramid all joins at a point. And the only figure that I can have that they all tilt and join at a point are triangles. A regular pyramid has a regular polygon for a base and its height meets at uh, the base at the center. A slant height of a regular pyramid is the altitude of any lateral face. A non-regular pyramid does not have slant height. So look at our first one. We can see we have just a pyramid, but then to the right-hand side, we have a regular pyramid. So we can see that um, it is straight up and down. Example one, finding the area of a lateral face. Notice we have a formula here. We have a different formula here that will be told to us over on page 736, but they give it to us in the problem before in example one, where we have slant height squared is equal to the height squared plus one half of a side squared. So if you wanna flip over for just a minute to 736 and look at the theorem at theorem 12.4, page 736, theorem 12.4, green box, surface area of a regular pyramid. S is equal to capital B plus one half times P times L. Okay, so this is for a regular pyramid. Surface area equals base plus one half of the perimeter times L, where that L is the slant height. Notice it's that little cursive, cursive you look in the L. Okay, that's one of the things they'll always write. Slant height will be like a lowercase cursive L, because if they just wrote L was a like a one, and then we know, and we don't want to use a capital L, okay? Like so yeah, because it's going to look like an angle, so we're not <laughs> sure is that an angle measure or whatever. So notice when you see that cursive L, that is what they're indicating for slant height, okay? But back to page 735, notice when I have a um, pyramid, 
Notice I've got right triangles here, don't I? I can break it into right triangles so I can have slant height squared equals height squared plus one half times the side squared. And then over in example two, I'm using surface area equals base plus one half PL. Okay, so where I'm using the shape of my base, plug it in my formula. Goal two, surface area of a cone. A circular cone or cone has a circular base and a vertex that is not in the same plane as the base. The altitude or height is the perpendicular distance between the vertex and the base. In a right cone, the height meets the base at its center and the slant height is the distance between the vertex and a point on the base edge. The lateral mm -hmm. surface of a cone consists of all the segments that connect the vertex with points on the base edge. When you cut along the slant height and lie the cone flat, you will get the net shown at the right. In the net, the circular base has an area of pi r squared and the lateral surface area is the sector of a circle. Sectors of a circle. Think about what we're doing right now in chapter 11 where we talked about these sectors of a circle. And so it says you can find the area of this sector by using the same formula that we just used. So we have the area of our sector over the area of a circle equals the arc length over the circumference. Okay, so all you've got to do is plug in the formula and you can find the surface area of a right cone. Okay, so basically in these situations, knowing these formulas, and that's what we're going to be working with next week, you're just going to have the basic formula, you're going to have the figure, you're going to plug in the values that you know to solve for what you need to know. Okay. So that's all dealing with surface area. Twelve four is volume of prisms and cylinders. Twelve five is volume of cones and cylinders, I think. Prisms and cones, pyramids and cones. Twelve six is surface area and volume of spheres. So we've talked about surface area of our figures. Twelve four and twelve five are going to deal with volume of prisms, pyramids, and cones. Twelve six is only dealing with spheres, surface area and volume of spheres. And then 12, seven, similar solids. Okay, so remember how we did similars where we set up our proportions and we said that the sides are proportional, the perimeters are proportional, but the area is going to be the squares. So we'll be kind of looking and wrapping those up on Monday, Monday, Wednesday. I'll be glad next week when my classes are actually split apart and they're not day after day. So, um, so we'll start with volume on Monday, Wednesday, good night. So Wednesday, we will probably wrap up this chapter as far as content goes. Your only homework is gonna be to be working on filling in your notes, okay, and your test, yep. And so we'll have some, some practice with these on Wednesday with using our formulas on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we'll just have some, some sheets practicing with these formulas and then we will be done. But I'm not gonna to try to cram any more into today. So we will be done for today. So if you haven't finished your notes, you can keep working on your notes right now. You can see that I only got to part of 12.5. I have not finished typing 12.5 yet. So I will have 12.5 and 12.5 12, finished and 12.6 and seven um, on Wednesday. So since we do still have a little bit of time, you can continue working on your notes if you um, need to work on those. All right, those of you online, let me know if you have any questions. Hey, where's Keely?